From the historic Black Creek Pioneer Village, I'm Michelle Rivard for Daytime Toronto. Joining me is historical interpreter Heather Tishner. Heather, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Doing excellent. It's my first time here at Black Creek Pioneer Village. Thank you so much for having You're us. You're welcome. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit just about what it is here. Okay, well Black Creek Pioneer Village is a living history museum where we demonstrate uh, what life was like in the 1860s in a small town in Ontario. Uh, and what we have here behind us is the Stong farmyard. So our village includes both a farm and buildings where we have tradespeople and uh, historic interpreters doing things like baking and spinning and showing all the ways uh, that people experienced life in the 1860s. So these sheep that we're looking at right here obviously have yet to be shown Born. Exactly. Do you do that here? We absolutely do. Uh, we have one sheep already that has been sheared. I don't think he's uh, visible at the moment, but <laughs> he's uh, hiding, he's yeah, exactly. But certainly every spring we do uh, give all our sheep a good shearing, and so all their wool will be coming off, and they will be ready to uh, have fun in the summer without their hot coats. And what do you do with the wool? Uh, we actually process it, so we do it just like they would have done in the uh, 1800s. We wash the wool. Very important, as you can see, <laughs> that is not a clean sheep. Uh, we wash it. We tease it, which means you're basically pulling out all the little bits that get stuck in there. Uh, we card it, which is brushing it and straightening it out, and then we spin it into yarn, and then we'll use that yarn for knitting and weaving. And so all of that's done here at Black Creek, and it's all done in the 1860s fashion? Absolutely, yeah, wow. and visitors can come and see that, uh, all the different types of the, the stages of the process all year in uh, several of our buildings, in fact. So you mentioned that this was the Stong farmyard. There are a few other buildings here that are Stong related, are they not? Absolutely, yes. Um, the Stongs actually were the first people to live uh, in this uh, particular section and it was their farm until the 1950s uh, and they sold the land to the Toronto Region Conservation Authority and we turned it into uh, Black Creek Pioneer Village and we're really uh, excited and um, happy to have the original farm buildings from the 1800s. The grain barn is uh, was built by Daniel Stong, the first house the log cabin, and the second house uh, historic building. So you mentioned that you have people that are um, making things and farming on the land. Mm -hmm. I see here the saddler and harness maker. Is that an actively used building? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. We do have a harness maker who works with leather and creates leather goods. And then we have someone doing some farming as well? Uh, yes, we do have our, that's our head gardener, Sandra Spudich, and so we do also not only have uh, historic activities taking place within the buildings, but uh, between the buildings uh, in our historic gardens as well. So what are some of the other buildings that we'd find here at Black Creek Pioneer Village? Uh, well, one that we have that's uh, fairly new uh, is we do have a historic brewery mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, where we actually make beer in 1860s style. Uh, we also have a blacksmith, a miller, uh, a cabinet maker, a printer. Uh, we have baking going on in several of the historic houses. We have a seamstress. Uh, and uh, a few other buildings as well. So you have um, quite a few school groups that come through. Mm -hmm. What are some of the activities that children take place in here? Okay, uh, well spelling bees are always very popular. Oh. Kids love to prove that they can spell well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they do spelling bees, uh, they will uh, learn their multiplication tables. Tongue twisters were actually a very uh, fun way to learn how to enunciate properly mm -hmm. in the 1860s. So we get the kids to do things like, you know, Peter Piper and uh, round, round knee, rolled a round roll. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just, I can't do it either. <laughs> With the topic of spelling bee, were words mm -hmm spelled differently? Because we're talking like almost 200 years ago. Um, words weren't really spelled differently. No. Uh, they're the same, but there are some words that uh, I think 1860s children would know that maybe children today don't have to learn how to spell because we don't use them. Things like bonnet or crinoline uh, or even, you know, Victoria, who was the queen at the time. We don't tend to think of her as much anymore. <laughs> I hope that children can spell Victoria. I yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So you were mentioning the brewery. So it's not mm. just fun for kids. There's obviously some nice adult fun too. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. um, tell me about the brewery. Okay, well the brewery, uh, it's in the bottom of the basement of the halfway house uh, and we actually have a brewer on site who comes in on the weekends and does brew in the 1860s style using 1860s recipes and he actually creates special brews throughout the year uh, so you can come and taste this like fresh beer. Uh, it does taste slightly different, it doesn't have as much carbonation as modern beer um, and our beer actually starting last year uh, is now available in the LCBO as well. So we're That was my next that. question. Oh. That's very <laughs> awesome. So we're in the 1860s, mm -hmm. um, that's pre-confederation for Canada. Mm -hmm. What was the political landscape like in this area? Ah, uh, that's a good question actually. I'm not sure if I know a lot about uh, the politics, um, but definitely, uh, you know, I think people in Ontario, or it was called Canada West at the time, yes. um, you know, they were starting to think about uh, joining up with the other provinces or colonies of the British uh, 
British Canada um, because of the Civil War going on in the States uh, in the early 1860s. That really made people concerned that maybe America was going to come up here and so we should maybe band together to uh, <laughs> to stop them from taking over. Uh, very cool. I see you've got some excited kids. <laughs> so how old are the average kids that come here to uh, Black Creek? Uh, during the school year we get a lot of grade three students because that is the year that they learn about pioneers and early settlers. So they learn about it in the class and then they get to come here and actually put a lot of their education in action. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys! <laughs> so, um, <laughs> look at them, excited. So what's happening here in the summer? Uh, in the summer we've actually got a lot of fun programs going on. Uh, we have games on the green where we will have croquet and badminton and a lot of period games. Uh, Hands on History Center will be open daily and that's a place where the kids can go and build a log cabin or try on pioneer clothes. Uh, we actually have a cricket game uh, happening a couple times this summer. Cricket was actually a very popular game in the 1860s. Uh, not so popular nowadays with um, some Canadians, but uh, it was really big back then. So everything that goes on is 1860s style from the way things are made to mm -hmm. the games that are played obviously to the fashion. <laughs> yes, um, so what are, what are you wearing there? Uh, well this is a fairly typical dress of the 1860s. Uh, I have on a full skirt uh, and a crinoline underneath it which is what gives it that uh, distinctive bell shape mm -hmm. and this would have been very fashionable in the 1860s and it was really only fashionable for about 10 or 20 years <laughs> yeah. and then and then it disappeared. Yeah, it's certainly, <laughs> yeah. certainly not so fashionable these days. Exactly. But I love the way it looks so I'd actually be really keen on trying one on. Oh, absolutely I think we can do that for you. Okay yeah. great. Well we're gonna have more more with Heather when we come back and uh, I may just look just this awesome. <laughs> well we're back at Black Creek Pioneer Village. Joining me again is Heather Tishner. We have transformed into <laughs> a more period appropriate look. So what have I got on here? Well, uh, you have on a actually very fancy 1860s mm -hmm. dress. Uh, it's two pieces, actually three uh, in a sense. So we've got the top, uh, the bottom skirt, which is not connected, and then your sleeves, uh, which are yes, actually sleeves. Yes. <laughs> very <laughs> beautiful inside. Yeah, and that's just a decorative. Yes, yeah, it's just to make sure because women wanted that full coverage to the wrist. You didn't want to show off your wrists, and you also have a very high neckline yeah. that was very uh, fashionable in the 1860s. You wouldn't be showing any uh, any shoulder or, or uh, collarbone. Yes, I'm very yes. covered up. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. is that, that's customary that's to the very era? Very customary, yes. So right. covered all the way to the neck, all the way to the wrist, and all the way uh, to the floor, in And fact. underneath, of course, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not this voluminous, but we have... <laughs> No, it's, I'm not supposed to show the petticoat, right? No, normally not. If there's no gentleman around, yes, it's okay. We can show them. Um, so what we have here is uh, the crinoline, which uh, yours is actually covered up, but you can see mine. Oh. Is actually, it's a set of wire hoops. This is steel uh, connected with tapes of lace, or linen, sorry. And it belts up at the waist. And then over top, you have a petticoat. So mine's a separate petticoat. Yours is actually... Uh, one piece. One piece. Yeah. It's all together. Yeah, and that was that. common as well. So this is two different ways of doing the same thing. Um, but having the cloth over top kind of smooths those lines. Otherwise you can see the the lines of the wire through the dress. So maybe perhaps because this dress is a bit fancier, it would want mm -hmm. that smoother look Absolutely. of the one-on-one yes. on one Yeah, petticoat. you don't want to see the, the lines through there. Uh, it looks a little, a little gauche. Not to go. <laughs> That's a term from the day too, oh, sure, isn't yes. it? For sure. Um, so the difference in style between these two dresses is mm. pretty apparent. Yes. This one's quite fancy. Yes, Where you've got I, the yeah. wider sleeves mm. uh, and the lace, a lot of lace detail at uh, both the wrist and the neck. I don't have any lace as you can see. Yeah. Um, so mine's a much plainer dress, um, perhaps suitable for a farm wife. Um, I could wear it actually without the hoop. Uh, in which case it would be much plainer and I'd use that during the day when I'm working. Um, and then maybe when I'm going to church uh, on a Sunday I might put the hoop on. It kind of just gives the dress the, a little bit more, uh, a little more style. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the 1860s wanted to wear the hoop. Your dress uh, would be suitable for perhaps a ball or a party. Uh, dances were very popular with mm. the Victorians and this would be, this would fit in, in any ballroom. I definitely feel very fancy yeah. in this one. <laughs> um, big difference between our mm -hmm. outfits, of course, the bonnet. Yes. yes. Now I didn't want to say anything earlier, but <laughs> you are not wearing a bonnet and we are outside and every lady would have to cover up her hair uh, when she's outside so that is something 
something that we would have to rectify. So why why do I have to cover my hair? Uh, it was just, uh, you know, it was the fashion, it was the way that they thought all ladies should uh, should be, and it was uh, something that, it was an idea that took place over centuries, really. Yeah. All ladies, as soon as they went outside, they covered up their hair. Uh, this is what's called a spoon bonnet, yeah. very fashionable in the 1860s. It kind of creates a, a wider face, mm -hmm. uh, which they really liked the wide face. Back then, they didn't want a lot of... Uh, height on top, they wanted to kind of open it up this way, which is the opposite, I think, of how we think of it. Totally, <laughs> yeah, today. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, really, the outfits are to make us a, a little more beautiful? Absolutely. Yeah, they want to give us the, uh, the 1860 silhouette. So you're going to have a wider face, yeah. uh, wider shoulders. You notice the, actually the hemline here uh, oh, drops yeah. off the shoulder. So you're, you're emphasizing the, the width of your shoulders, but then uh, you, we'd have a corsets underneath. Yeah. I didn't mention those. The corset's going to bring you in at the waist, give you a narrow waist, and then the skirt is going to Billow back out again. So like a very extreme hourglass, really. Exactly. Yeah, it's a very extreme hourglass. <laughs> and um, also, I get deductions for my hair. Yes, it's it's Got short, hair. which would not be very common back then. No. Uh, most ladies uh, grew their hair out long, and they would put it back in a, a low bun or maybe some braids. Um, I'll be honest, I have short hair under here too, oh. but I'm wearing a bonnet, so you can't tell. <laughs> Fair enough. So when would be my opportunity to wear pants? Um, fortunately, never. I'm afraid in the 1860s. These ladies did not wear pants. Ever? Oh, ever. Ever. Because <laughs> gender roles, we can't talk about this kind of stuff and mm -hmm. not really talk about gender mm -hmm. role that Absolutely. played a major, major part they in sure everything. Yes. Yeah. The Victorians definitely believed that the genders were different and so they needed to be treated differently and they needed to do things differently. Uh, in fact, even what we're wearing, this big hoop really uh, speaks to that because with, when a lady's wearing a hoop like this, she can't do a lot of things. <laughs> uh, it just gets in the way. Yeah. Uh, so ladies are supposed to be calm and graceful and quiet and demure um, and so they're supposed to glide along in the hoops and, and, and uh, sit quietly and work on their handicrafts. Uh, whereas oh. Gentlemen are supposed to be boisterous and you know masculine and out in the world and conquering and uh, yeah. so they need pants and they need to have you know these energetic uh, clothes that allow for movement. Yeah. So we're outside the doctor's house mm -hmm. or the doctor's office and uh, obviously that doctor is not a woman. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the doctor was definitely male uh, and we actually reflect a lot of those gender divisions uh, in our interpreters here in the village. So right. uh, the doctor will be male although we do sometimes have the doctor's wife in so she will be in the house. Um, the printer is male, the tinsmith is male, the blacksmith is male. Mm. Uh, so a lot of the jobs uh, when you're working out in the world they're going to be for men only. So as a woman in my 20s, what would my daily life be like? Uh, it would depend a lot on what uh, what class you were. Okay. And probably by your mid to late 20s, you're going to be married. So what your husband does for a living. Uh, so if you are a farm wife, you would actually be working a lot. Uh, yeah. You probably would not be wearing the hoop during the day. You'd be out milking the cow, tending the vegetable gardens, looking after the kids. Um, if your husband, however, was a doctor or a lawyer. Yes, yes, that's you, what I'm hoping. That's yes. still what I'm hoping for <laughs> okay, today. All right, yeah. <laughs> uh, still very good professions. Um, you probably be wearing the hoop more often. You would yeah. not be working for a living. So Fabulous. you can wear this every day. Uh, maybe not quite so shiny a fabric, but you know, you still wear the hoop and lace. Yeah. Uh, and you would be sitting at home um, doing a lot of embroidery, um, charity work perhaps, and, uh, and going to lots of balls and, and dinner parties. Yeah, but really, I mean, that <laughs> doesn't sound too, too different from what we're used to, <laughs> other than really just depending on what that yes, man you've chosen exactly. to do with has to do. Yeah. Huh. So you've got a game here for us to try and play. I do, yes. And what's this one called? <laughs> uh, well, this is a game called Graces. And this is actually, speaking of uh, gender roles, it's a perfect game to illustrate that because this is a game that is suitable for young girls and it's to teach them grace. So that's where the name uh, of the game comes from. Oh, the graces. The graces, so to give a, ladies grace. A lesson grace. in grace. Exactly. Now, see, okay. We have here a selection of, um, they're basically just wooden uh, hoops that have been tied with ribbon mm -hmm. and that's just to make them a little fancier and the ribbon looks nice as it's flying through the air because what Great. we're going to be doing is actually um, tossing the hoop back and forth to each other but we're going to be using these sticks. Okay. Uh, so Let's give it a like try. Just choose a, choose a hoop. I like purple. All right, we can set the rest down. Just gracefully. Exactly. Exactly. So I'll give you two sticks. Okay. If you want to start? I'll what about how? Show, okay, show me I'll what show we're you doing. How to do. Okay. Okay. So how this works basically is you're using the sticks to uh, throw the hoop to uh, the other girl, and this will be something that primarily would be for for women or young girls, but boys were known to play as well. So if uh, if a young boy was playing this, he wouldn't be teased or anything. Okay. They have, they have to learn some grace too. It's just Fair not enough. quite as important for them. Okay. All um, right. So I'm holding the graces, uh, the sticks, kind of in a scissor fashion here, uh, and I'm just going to flick my wrist and toss you the hoop, and you have to catch it. Oh. There we go with your Lovely. sticks and. and 
you t you caught it very gracefully as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, tr I'm trying because if that's the point, I gotta. Yeah. So I do the X so shape the X and, and then, then flick your wrist. There we go. And I will. Oh, oh I'm not as graceful. I'm afraid. <laughs> I have to work on that. <laughs>